the title of uh, my talk is a bit misleading, I'm afraid, although this is going to be just another boring praxeology lecture, <laughs> although I will put in some, uh, some comments about opposition to uh, the great thinkers of the past. Uh, Sandy Klein reminded me that I should mention this point that some of you may wonder uh, when you learn about praxeology, well, it's all rather abstract. Uh, what can I do if I've learned praxeology? What, what is a good thing to do? Well, one thing you can do with it, you can always open a praxeology shop. <laughs> now, uh, what I want to do is, uh, I'm also the lectures in mis the title of the lecture is misleading in this way that uh, it's a 10 men who made the West. Uh, at my glacial pace, I'll be lucky to get through three or four. <laughs> uh, the uh, people I'm going to be talking about are all falling to the category of dead white males. <laughs> in in uh, recent times, there have been a movement that uh, says this is, we shouldn't concentrate on uh, dead white males. This is uh, racist or sexist. And there have been uh, serious proposals by people to uh, either get rid of these thinkers or to uh, at least add other thinkers who don't fall into this, these categories. Uh, if we take the phrase dead white males, uh, Bob Nozick objected to that. He said the part of dead white males, uh, protests against dead white males that bothered him the most was the reference to dead people. He said, it's really not fair to attack those who can't fight back. <laughs> now, the first one I want to talk about is the great uh, Greek philosopher Aristotle, who lived from 384 to 322 BC. And one of the uh, most important of his discoveries uh, had to do with logic. Uh, Aristotle is one is really the person who first systematized the rules of deductive reasoning, especially syllogistic reasoning. A syllogism is something like all men are mortal. Socrates was a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Uh, there were other Greeks who worked on other types of logic, such as the Stoics worked on various kinds of hypothetical reasoning, but Aristotle was the main one who systematized deductive reasoning. And I'd like to one point, as you will learn by now, deductive reasoning is the way we reason in praxeology. And I think that people in uh, thinking about this tend to concentrate too much on whether the premises are a priori or a posteriori, what the nature of the premises are. But the more important thing is the deduction that in deductive reasoning, if we have true premises and we reason validly in, uh, in, in, accordance, with, in accordance with these premises, then the conclusion is 
guaranteed to be true uh, if we have a valid argument, which means one that follows the rules of deducts, deductive inference, and the premises are true, that's called a sound argument. So all, uh, all sound arguments are valid, but we can have valid arguments with that aren't sound, that have at least one false premise. So the key point is that if we start with the uh, with the premises that are true and we reason correctly, then we've got a true conclusion. But we have to be very careful about the way we reason. It's easy to make mistakes in reasoning. And I'd like to take as an example, I want to give an argument that some, one sometimes here, one sometimes here. Here is, I understand that one of the lecturers used this argument, but in my opinion, it's not a, it's not a sound argument, although the conclusion is true. I should say, I warned the lecturer about this, so <laughs> I'm not pulling any surprises. Uh, the argument I have in mind is this, uh, it's claimed that we can't know future knowledge where that's reference either to our own knowledge or the knowledge that uh, we would, a society will have. We can't know future knowledge because if we did know the future knowledge, then it wouldn't be future knowledge. We would know it now. So it's a contradiction to say we could know future knowledge. Now, uh, how many of you would be inclined to say that's a sound argument? Oh, and how many would think there are problems with it? <laughs> oh. Well, uh, uh, does anyone have any idea what the problem might be, or anybody want to try anything? Uh, Quantifier shift fallacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very often a problem, but not, I don't think not this time. <laughs> but I, that phrase is one I'm somehow familiar with. Well, I think now, one thing we have to be clear about, I think the conclusion that uh, we don't know what our knowledge is going to be in the future is very likely true. People are coming up with all sorts of new inventions and other developments that people didn't predict, and it seems very unlikely that people would be able to predict all the new developments. But the point at issue is not whether the conclusion is true, but whether this argument is correct. Now, to see what I is wrong with it, I think we have to distinguish two meanings of future knowledge. We would have future knowledge in the narrow sense, which would be knowledge that we don't have now but will have in future, and then future knowledge in the extended sense, which would be knowledge that we have now and will continue to have in the future plus the knowledge that we don't have now and will have in the future. Say, we know now that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, presumably, we'll we will continue to know that. 
in the future unless uh, certain educational reformers have their way. So we have to distinguish these two categories. Now, if we take knowledge in the, in the strict sense of knowledge we don't know now but will know in the future, then, of course, it's true that we don't know future knowledge now because we simply define future knowledge as knowledge we don't know now. So it must be the case we don't know future knowledge. But the, tr the problem is if we go to the extended sense where we have knowledge, future knowledge is knowledge that we continue to have plus knowledge we don't have now, then it doesn't follow that we, we can't know our future knowledge. And the reason for that is we have the future knowledge is knowledge we have now plus knowledge we don't have now and will have in future. And it, it could be the case, it hasn't been ruled out, that knowledge we, we uh, don't have now but will have in the future is an empty class. It could be that we have all the knowledge now that we will have in future and it hasn't been ruled out. The, the argument that we can't know future knowledge in the strict sense doesn't rule out the possibility that we don't, we never learn anything new. It would be perhaps an analogy, uh, an example might make this clear. Suppose I say, well, I'm going to give a multiple choice test and no one will get all the answers correct because you can't get the correct answers to the ones you miss. So no one will get the correct result. That would be silly because it doesn't follow just because you can't get the right answers to the ones you miss that you are going to miss any. So you see it's quite this uh, same point is in this argument that uh, you, you can't know future knowledge because if you did know it, you would know it now. Uh, the argument uh, I think was used, one of the ones who first used it was uh, Karl Popper in his book, The Introduction to the Poverty of Historicism that came out in 1957. It, it's a very good book, but I don't think that argument is right. So, as I say, uh, Aristotle systematized logic, and we have to be very careful the way we use uh, logic. Now, another point at which Aristotle made a major contribution in one relevant to praxeology is in the notion of action, which is the key concept in praxeology. Action is the use of means to achieve ends. Aristotle has this idea that this is the way he, he analyzes human behavior, that he has this clear teleological structure of action. And he used this notion of ends or goals as a way of developing a system of ethics and I, the key idea, or one of the key ideas 
in understanding Aristotle's ethics, uh, we could get at in this way, we would say, what is it if we're looking, saying, what is good? What is the good? Uh, according to Aristotle, we can, uh, when we say something is good, we have to say a good what? It's a, a, what he called an attributive adjective. Say something is, if I say something is a good knife, it would be something that's uh, sharp and able to cut or for all sorts of, of objects we could ask, what is a good thing of that kind? Aristotle thought there were certain natural kinds in the world. There were substances of various sorts. And we could ask, what is a good uh, thing of that kind? Uh, that's to be distinguished from a predicative use of good, where we say something like uh, promoting the greatest good of the greatest number is good, that that would just say this state of affairs has this quality, but we wouldn't be say, uh, using it as a, an adjective, uh, 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 an attributive adjective. We wouldn't be saying, we're not saying, we say uh, promoting the greatest happiness of the greatest number is good. We're not saying there's something of which that is true. Uh, this uh, is a big division between Aristotelian ethics and some of the more modern ethical systems, for example, in uh, Utilitarianism is a system where we take good to be a predicative adjective. Uh, uh, G. Moore is a famous philosopher who talked about was, was the good in that way. So the way this applies to ethics, if we say, say what is a good human being. And uh, Aristotle answered this, a good human being is a human being that exercises the proper function of a human being. And the way, according to him, this is what we determine the proper function is we say what is the quality that human beings have that distinguishes them from other entities? And he said this was being a rational animal. So according to him, the function of ethics is to develop ourselves as rational animals. And in doing this, we'll achieve our flourishing or well-being if we develop our, according to our proper function. As you will imagine, uh, those, uh, those arguments are quite controversial. There are many people who say the notion of function doesn't apply to human beings, it applies only to uh, constructed objects. Say we can talk about the function of tools or other things that we construct, but it doesn't make sense according to those people that uh, talk about function of human beings. But uh, Murray Rothbard accepted Aristotelian ethics. So he thought there was a human essence and that the way we achieve our well-being is to develop ourselves as 
our rationality. And then he went on to uh, talk about what was necessary to do that. And as we'll see later in the lecture, if I get that far, which is very doubtful, we'll see how Rothbard uh, changed around, uh, altered uh, Aristotle's ethics. Uh, now one point before we leave Aristotle is this. Uh, there are some people who argue that the notion of a human essence or nature has been refuted by modern biology and that biologists take species to be simply interbreeding populations. And so this renders Aristotle's account obsolete. Uh, I don't think that's a very good argument because uh, biologists might, for their own purposes, have a different way of looking at species, but it doesn't follow from that that what Aristotle said is wrong. He's trying to answer, he was trying to answer different questions, and his way of conceiving uh, the human essence is based on a philosophical analysis of the concept. So whether he, he, he thought, although he thought that this could also be applied to biology, perhaps he's wrong about that, to, about that, it doesn't invalidate what he said from the standpoint of ethics. Oh good, I finally got to the next slide. <laughs> I, I, I was hoping I would. You know, these, I mean, I, I know I'm slow, but this is ridiculous. Uh, now, I want to talk now about uh, John Locke, who had a new view of natural law and this is one that uh, Murray Rothbard took over. But before uh, going into that, he was one whose Locke has been one who's been subject to attack by some of the politically correct people. Uh, there was an influential book by the uh, philosopher from Jamaica, uh, Charles. W. Mills called the racial contract. So what Mills argued in his book was, as you probably know uh, from uh, studying your political philosophy, you, you no doubt come across the notion that Locke talked about a social contract in which people start out with natural rights and then they agree to uh, form a society and once they've done that, they have another contract by which they uh, form a government. So this sounds, when you first hear it according to Mills, this sounds like a reasonable idea. It's there are objections, there are no doubt objections to it, but it doesn't sound like there's anything bad about it. But according to Mills, there is something bad about it. And uh, could anyone guess what that is? What's bad in this notion of the social contract? Uh, well, that's a standard philosophical uh, objection to it, but that wouldn't show it's really evil or bad. Uh, yeah. Does he criticize it for maybe being like too Eurocentric or uh, white? Or yeah, yes, you're on the right track there. What he says is this contract is based on a prior contract, which is 
this, the uh, notion of the contract really applies only to white men. And the prior contract is to exclude people of other races, especially blacks, from, from society. So he says, well, this is assuming that the whole notion of a social contract, the purpose of it is to justify enslaving people of other races or enslaving blacks. And he uh, adduces in support that uh, Locke invested in uh, companies that uh, participated in the slave trade and he uh, wrote the constitution for one of the colonies that uh, talked about what they should do in, uh, on slave plantation. What I would say there is that may well show inconsistencies in Locke's personal behavior, but it doesn't show anything wrong with the notion of the social contract. And uh, it certainly seems a legitimate question to ask what rights people have in the, based on a social contract. Also a problem with Mills' argument is that there are a number of places where Locke explicitly condemns slavery for anybody except for he, he allows cases where people are taken prisoner in war and then uh, become enslaved in return for not being killed. That's something found in Hobbes as well. So there really isn't any textual evidence for what Mills said. But regardless of whether uh, Mills is correct, uh, I think we have to look at what is this new version of natural law that uh, Locke pioneered and that Murray Rothbard accepted. And the new version has to do with the political philosophy. In Aristotle's ethics, uh, once he's got this notion of flourishing, he says that we start off with families and then the families get together and form a city or a polis. And he says they come, they, the purpose of the city is to promote virtue. So in the in the city, the government would be taking a very active role of promoting virtue, say, would require people to worship the gods of the city. And it would be very much a closed community. And Locke said, no, this is wrong. Each individual should be regarded as having rights independent of society. We start off with individual rights holders and each person owns himself or herself. Each person is a self-owner and also at, since each person is a self-owner, if there, are, if since resources uh, start off not owned by anyone, each person can acquire resources by what he called mixing his labor with the resources. That's metaphorical expression means uh, doing something, appropriating them, doing something to. Uh, fence them off from other people. Of course, what the 
you have to do to acquire resources is not something that's really specified. It would have to be dependent on particular societies. And if the question comes up, why, if there are all these resources around, why do individuals have a right to take them? One of the arguments Locke gave is that once we have money introduced into an economy, it's not the case that if one person appropriates certain resources, that leaves fewer resources for other people to appropriate. They won't have a chance to appropriate anything because the once money exists, it multiplies the available resources to people. So it no longer is a, a constant sum game where one person's acquisition is at the expense of everybody else's. So this modification of natural law was one that Rothbard accepted. Uh, I should mention there is one interpretation of Locke, which is, was uh, fi you find in Leo Strauss's book, uh, Natural Right in History, uh, and also in the work of the uh, Canadian Marxist C.B. McPherson called The Political Theory Possessive Individualism, which argues that Locke really didn't believe in individual rights at all. He was just a uh, really uh, utilitarian who was trying to uh, favor, said he favored institutions that would develop the, uh, the market economy, which was on the rise in the 17th century when he was writing. This is rather a uh, Marxist interpretation. It might be surprising that uh, Leo Strauss favored this view since Strauss is generally viewed as a right-wing or conservative figure. But in fact, when uh, uh, Strauss was really following the ideas of the British socialist, not a Marxist, but British socialist, uh, R.H. Tawney, Richard Henry Tawney, who had this view that uh, the, the individualism of the incipient market economy displaced the more communal property that had been present early. So Strauss was, was friends with Tawney and he was viewed as, he was uh, uh, really in that respect a disciple of him. I remember when uh, I mentioned to my great teacher, Walter Starkey, who knew practically everyone important in, uh, in England from the 1920s through the 1950s, I mentioned uh, Leo Strauss. He said, oh, yes, yes, he was a friend of Tawney's. So that was how he immediately identified him. So as I say, that's an interpretation of Locke, but I don't think it's very plausible. It depends on Strauss's method was really very often involved saying uh, the author of a particular text doesn't mean what he appears to mean on the surface. There's a hidden or esoteric meaning that one has to dig out. And this usually involves uh, denying what the author appears to be asserting. Seems like way you could really, uh, you could really say that an author 
uh, favors whatever you want him to favor. You just say there's evidence against it from the text. Well, the text doesn't really mean that. It doesn't sound like a very good idea, although I suppose it has its, point, its points in its favor if you want to really argue for something. It's a bit underhanded, but for some people that isn't, uh, that isn't a problem. It might actually be a virtue. Uh, oh, good, now we get into another slide. Yeah, so this one. Now, uh, I want to talk Mises, uh, of course, we know as the developer of praxeology, and I want uh, to say a little bit on how his approach to praxeology differed from that of Murray Rothbard. Uh, the way Mises viewed praxeology was uh, we're developing, we're asking what is involved in the concept of action. And he was trying to draw various consequences of this concept. So he was arguing mainly from its rather, from the point of view of theory of knowledge, it's an epistemological approach. It's saying, uh, we, what is the way of accounting for our knowledge of certain economic phenomena? phenomena. So he would say, uh, supposing we're trying to understand money, say we see people exchanging objects for paper, money, or checks, or other uh, types of financial transaction. He said, unless we had the concept of money, we wouldn't be able to understand what was going on. We would just see people passing, uh, passing pieces of paper. We wouldn't understand this. So in Mises' view, we need certain concepts in order to make sense of what is going on in the economy. And uh, Murray Rothbard had a rather different view. His view was more emphasizing metaphysics, meaning the nature of things in the world. And what Rothbard said is we can grasp necessities in the world. Uh, say we see various objects, say we see various colors, we don't, uh, we don't grasp these necessities through, this, through our senses. Say if we say, I see that uh, something is green like my face. Uh, so I, I, we say, we see this, this wouldn't involve any knowledge of necessities, but he thought that by abstraction we can get knowledge of what is necessarily the case, what must be the case. So this is uh, when he said something was known a priori, he meant more we know it as necessarily true. It's something that we grasp. Say, if we say human beings act, we grasp that this is part of the human essence to act, whereas Mises' approach was epistemological. How do we know things? Uh, now, one of the contributions uh, Mises made uh, depends on uh, his, it really isn't 
is an answer to a problem raised by his system of ethics. Now, Mises didn't accept natural law at all. He thought that ethical judgments are just subjective preferences. So people, it might be the case that, say if I say I something is good, that just is an expression of my preference for that. So it would seem that that would make it hard to argue with other people about what's good because we would just have one set of preferences against someone else's. But Mises thought that everybody or nearly everybody favors peace and prosperity. One of his reasons for thinking that is that people who aren't interested in material prosperity will tend to die out. So the ones who are left are the ones who favor uh, peace and prosperity. And then he thought, although that preference is subjective, we can't say it's objectively good that peace and prosperity are ought to be something that people want. People, in fact, do want these things. And then we can ask, well, how are those things to be achieved? So we can have, if you want peace and prosperity, you should do such and such. And Mises thought those ideas were all were uh, something that could be established. And he argued that we could show on that basis that the free market ought to be established given that everyone or nearly everyone wants peace and prosperity. And the way he did that was that uh, he said, well, there, there are only certain, there are only really two possible systems of organizing the economy, either the market or socialism, which is a centrally planned economy. Sometimes in his, as in his book on socialism, he distinguishes a third system called syndicalism, but I won't go into that. In fact, I'm not going to be able to go into much, much more. Uh, so he said there's no third system, that a third system would be one of interventionism, but he said we could show by value-free arguments that the interventionist measures won't achieve the purpose of the people who favor them. They'll just interfere with the market. So although Mises had a, uh, this, nat uh, this rejected natural law, he thought there could be an argument that would give us support for the free market. Uh, Rothbard didn't ex thought that there was a great deal in Mises' points, but he thought that we needed natural law as well, that he thought uh, Mises' arguments against natural law were not correct. So those are a few of the thinkers uh, who made the West. And I, I, uh, I want to thank you for listening to my rather boring comments. Thank you.